But inevitably, it was haute couture, where there was no such thing as a bottom line, where Galliano's creativity really took flight. In locations that were ever more dreamlike, he spun stories that were ever more fanciful around characters whose connection with the real world grew ever more tenuous. So you're playing Madahari? What does that involve? I think it's just about expressing yourself freely. A certain individuality. I mean, she was just one of a kind, a complete original for her time. Do you like what John Galliano has done for the culture? I love Kutu? what John Galliano does. I think he's the most talented, and I think he has poetry. A lot of people try to do outrageous things, but John really, I think, loves women, has a wonderful, wonderful sense of what a woman should be, is, and, uh, and he makes you dream, and he's really talented, and he's by far the biggest talent today. The most triumphant was staged in January 1998 at Paris's Baroque Opera Garnier. The muse of the collection was the turn of the century eccentric Marchesa Cassati. But Galliano and his set designer Michael Howells also drew on Sergei Diaghilev's immortal ballet russe as inspiration for a vision of Edwardian luxury that seemed filtered through an opium haze. describe that show it's flawless and just beyond beyond creative and imaginative and it was a dream and it was energy and it was beyond fashion too oh well that, that's the best part of it it wasn't about fashion it was about a sheer genius And all the time, Galliano was mounting productions of a similar extravagance and complexity for his own label. His challenge was to establish distinct personalities for his two responsibilities. Sometimes he met the challenge. Other times, the orgies of bias-cut glamour began to melt together in the mind. But it's fair to say that his own collections were generally darker, more decadent and perverse, with influences ranging from gypsy travellers and punks to whacked out nightclubbers in the Weimar Republic. Can we just fill the cameras for a minute? It was a Galliano delirium. Celebrities celebrated him on both sides of the Atlantic. He also received the prestigious International Designer of the Year Award from the Council of Fashion Designers of America. At the end of the 18th century, the English spent great fortunes to keep out wild revolutionary ideas from Paris. At the end of the 20th century, the French were now caught napping. They had been invaded and conquered by wild revolutionary ideas from England. The CFTA salutes London's new Scarlet Pimpernel, John Galliano. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. But it's a sad fact of life that if you eat a lot of rich food, you'll eventually end up with indigestion. And that happened to Galliano six months after his night at the opera. The burgeoning theatricality of his shows was already leaving him open to charges that he was a costumier rather than a couturier. Then he decided to take over a train station in Paris for a convoluted epic that combined Pocahontas and Anne Boleyn arriving on a steam engine and, well, let's just say it was hysterical as well as historical. Galliano was clearly in need of a new direction. Now, the response to that collection was a little <laughs> bit, um, shall we say, ambiguous. And you were... That's putting it nicely. <laughs> well, how would you describe it? Um, it was really interesting. I learned a lot from that collection because, I mean, a lot of people believed in it and what we were doing and then suddenly it just didn't seem the right thing to do. And what I learned from there is that you just got to do what you believe in. But it's a criticism that has been leveled at you, that at some point the clothes become costumes. 
and, and it struck a lot of people as very significant that after that show there was definitely a, a pulling back. After the, the um, Pocahontas collection, the, this grand salon was ready. It just seemed right to come back in-house, see the clothes close up, and I thought, oh, it'd be fab to do a smaller presentation. I think that like, you know, there's two forces at work. You have this extravagant imagination of John Galliano and you have a commercial house that really, I mean, a great design commercial house, but Dior still wants to sell stuff. It's an odd balance. It's like, okay, you know, do stuff, but we gotta sell lipstick. At the time, Galliano's return to the Dior boutique was viewed by critics as a retreat, an impression that wasn't helped by that overtly sellable collection of knitwear. But hindsight is usually much kinder than critics. Now we can see the move as the assertion of a commercial savvy that was as much of a surprise from Galliano as his previous extravagances. This was the birth of John Galliano, brand master. But did it also coincide with, with a, a slight shift in your sensibility that um, I know I've read that, that you became more aware of, of well, I suppose, the bottom line in a yeah, way? Yeah, you do. I mean, also, I, mean I, I don't have my own stores yet. But um, Dior has 80, well, I think it's about 80 worldwide. So I'm very much, I, I, I became fascinated with the whole marketing, the merchandising, of, and seeing your clothes actually sell and who they're selling to and what was shifting and what wasn't. And uh, yeah, that took, that was really important to us. At the end, uh, is not art. Fashion is, uh, is something related with the, the consumption of a product at the end. So. We think it's a business at the end. The new collections and me being involved with the, um, the advertising has brought in a, a great new clientele. She was average 50, she's now 25. And she's spending. And she's spending. With uh, John Galliano designing for your now we certainly brought the new uh, finesse, the new uh, seduction, much more uh, glamour. Uh, who, who, in a way, we, we recreate that new glamour corresponding to younger women, you know, such as uh, Nicole Kidman, Madonna, which are all our clients now. Madness, decadence, delirium. These are the words that have followed Galliano his whole career. You could say that they're the downside of an addiction to beauty. And John Galliano is nothing if not one of fashion's great obsessive compulsives. But it takes a rare kind of discipline to make it work the way he has. You can see that in his transformed appearance. It's nothing less than an iron will finding physical expression. Any morning you might see him pounding along these streets with his personal trainer. I wasn't eating correctly, I wasn't breathing correct, I mean I was drinking, I, you know, drinking coffee, all those bad things that I thought, you know, coffee would give me zip, a glass of red wine would help me unwind, wrong, I was doing it all wrong. So I started training and um, first of all I got really hooked because it was just that precious time on my own with my trainer, whether it was running for an hour and a half, or I'd just be concentrating on my breathing. And I'd find solutions to problems without even thinking about it. And I thought, oh, I like this, you know, it was good. And then I got more and more serious, and then, and then, I'm, it's more for vitality. I mean, I, I'm more positive, I've got more energy. Um, you know, I can give people a good run for their money. You were fantastic. <laughs> In the past, Galliano's constantly changing image has always embodied the essence of whatever designs he was working on at the time. So if he is radiating raw energy right now, he's just feeling the pulse of his latest collections. Forget the Marquesas, the princesses, the delicacy of the salon. This is all about